Hello, uh, I'm Justin, from originally from the University of Queensland, uh, where I was doing uh, interaction design and IT, so kind of a, a blend between the engineering end of things and the human-centered design experience stuff. So, um, as it turns out, that's kind of exactly the skill set that is great for iPhone development, so that's what I tend to do. Um, uh, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, a little protocol, um, a data protocol that I've run across as part of my day-to-day -day work, um, which is part of a much larger and pretty awesome open source project that uh, I'll talk you through later on. Um, that is, has the goal of trying to reinvent um, basically communication data for um, particularly modern web applications but as I'm uh, hoping to show today um, with this presentation, also uh, within uh, iOS applications and, uh, and mobile applications of all kinds. Um, the main advantage being that we can, we can change from this uh, since the 70s sort of pool model of, uh, of data where you ask for some data, it comes down, the connection closes, uh, that's it. Um, very much more interesting now that we're starting to see um, things like WebSockets being standardized is that we can start doing some of the other patterns for uh, data communication exchange between applications. Different ways of getting your content that have been around for a long time but just haven't been possible on the web because the web is fundamentally that connect, grab data, pull mechanism. Uh, so the other things like PubSub, which you might have heard of, um, push-based stuff, so Apple's very, very into this, uh, into push. Um, these sort of protocols have existed for, for a very, very long time. The patterns have been there since the Gang of Four published uh, 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 I've forgotten the name of the thing, the pattern language. And we're just now starting to see the ability for it to be used more wide scale because instead of being able to do it just within two trusted computers on the same network, all of a sudden we have these standardized protocols for doing that between untrusted machines elsewhere on the internet. That's where why the sort of the playing ground has really changed. Um, and in that sense, uh, a lot more of the open source programmers who are sort of been doing web applications for a very long time have decided, well, why do it that way anymore? We have new alternatives available to us. And what we're talking about today, DDP uh, and the Meteor framework, uh, is one of those such attempts, and it's a pretty good one. So the question that you will eventually get to if you're building an ISO application, um, unless you're uh, building a very specific type, if you build a Twitter application, You've already answered this question, where do I get my data from? Um, well, you're getting it from the Twitter APIs. So you do it exactly how they say that you can. Um, if you're building a, um, a Facebook app, again, you're stuck with that. If you're building, if you're passing news.com.au, you know where your data is coming from. But at some point, if you want to do something a, a little more custom, a little more your own, you're going to have to decide, how am I going to get this data into the application? And you've got a number of options there, like you could just do it on the phone, like Vespa did that. Um, which, you know, it, it works. I mean, I started using, I'm not sure if you guys have used Vespa, the John Gruber's notes application. Great little app. I updated my iOS, lost everything um, because the backup wasn't compatible. Kind of a bit of, kind of a, a, bit of a problem. Um, I mean, but it can work for you. Um, yeah, there are other options are iCloud. If you're one of the few people who've managed to make iCloud um, core data sync work, then more power to you because it promises to be awesome. Nine times out of 10, it just doesn't work. Clear have done it, um, which is great. I'd love to see more apps like that, but again, um, most people are having a lot of problems with iOS core data sync. So the probably the most common solution that people end up doing, um, just because it's there and it's been around for a very long time, is they build a web API. They have a, a web server backend, and that becomes the single version of truth for their application. They go, okay, uh, here's the iOS app. The content's on a database on the server. I'll make a API connection to that, pull that data down, that's what I'm going to show on screen. And usually, it's in the, except in the cases of applications that are designed to work offline, which they all should, but um, often they don't, including, for example, Fitbit, which I'm really annoyed by, um, you uh, then if you're offline, you get no data, and the data is replaced every time. So you always know you've got that single version of truth. You don't have to go uh, have that whole complex syncing problem that you have with say core data sync or, or application sync where you're like, well, I changed something on this phone, then I changed something on the iPad, and then I sync them both, and which one is true 
Is it the server? Is it the iPad? Do you use timestamps? Do you merge them? All sorts of complexities of sync. Most of the time, people just throw that away and say the server is true uh, and download it every time. Which, again, it does work for a lot of scenarios. And if you're just dealing with content, it's great. The simple fact of the matter in the current uh, state of affairs is when we're talking about content in an iOS application and how we're going to get to that content, we're probably talking about HTTP. Um, for the overwhelming of majority of applications, um, it's going to be HTTP. Some form of connect to that server, download a bunch of data in some sort of format. It could be JSON, it could be plain text, it could be a HTML page, but it's going to come from a server somewhere. HTTP is great. Um, for the overwhelming majority of these applications, um, it's the most simple and straightforward protocol. It's excellent, it's stable, it's been standardized for years. Um, and it's, yeah, it's simple. So the idea of RESTful web services, excuse me, sorry, stick that as far. Um, RESTful web services succeeded so successfully on the, when it came to not only the web when we started seeing Ajax applications uh, and also the early days of iOS, REST absolutely cleaned up because it is so simple. It is literally just the HTTP protocol. I want to get some data, I make a HTTP get request to URL, data comes back. Uh, none of these bollocks that comes with SOAP where you build a big XML document and maybe you've misspelled the, uh, the method there so you get a rejection from the server. Um, you have to go through and pass a document, find that one thing. Um, it quickly gets a nightmare. Sim simple app object access protocol, um, which was the previous technology. Um, was always doomed to be not anything but simple. Um, so that was kind of the way it was. So REST cleaned up, and REST is still cleaning up. It's a wonderful protocol because it's so simple. But what is actually wrong with HTTP? Um, it's strong to say there's anything wrong with it. It works, it works extremely well for the, the scenarios in which it's set up. Um, it's based on that rock solid protocol, and it's not going away. It's good enough for most purposes. But it does have, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, quite a few limitations. Um, HTTP is fundamentally a pool-based protocol. It's a, it's a protocol, it is literally the hypertext transfer protocol. It's designed to make a connection to a server, grab a whole web page, some simple marked up text, and pull that thing down, close the connection. Works very well for that one type of interaction. Um, doesn't work quite so well when you want to do something different. So we've all had all these sort of intermediary hack solutions. I'm not sure how many of you have ever tried to build a, um, a web, an XML application, that's uh, an Ajax application that keeps a connection open for a long time and treats it like, so if you've ever tried to build a chat app using long polling, um, it works, it's hacky, it's painful, if it falls over, you've got to try and figure out why it's fallen over. Um, sometimes you don't even get notified, depending on the browser, it's kind of a, a bit of a nightmare. Um, so a lot of these other scenarios where we, we need the idea of keeping the connection open and doing other things with data, particularly in this idea of pushing data down. So rather than saying, I'm going to connect to that server and pull whatever I want when I ask for it, I want to know when something new happens. I don't want to grab the whole web page. I just want to know one field has changed, tell me. So these push state scenarios are becoming more and more popular. I mean, and iOS and other mobile interfaces have really driven that. Um, the push notification API protocol is fundamentally a different approach to getting data to applications than making a HTTP connection and pulling that down. Um, and in, if you find, in fact, the way that Apple's push notification service works is very similar to uh, the way WebSockets will, uh, works and the way we'll be talking about doing stuff today, uh, in that it is actually maintaining uh, a long-running connection. When that connection closes, it opens it up again. So your phone is constantly connected to this Apple server, just so that when something happens, it can, it can feed down to your application and say, hey, there's something interesting happening here. So we want to be able to do that in our apps. So we want to be able to do more with push than just receiving uh, background app notifications. And that's where these um, second wave protocols, which are, again, old, old networking being repurposed for the modern age, become really handy. I want my, there we go. So enter WebSockets. So WebSockets is kind of old tech repurposed for a new generation, which is great. So the thing about um, WebSockets is they are literally TCP networking made available on the web. So underneath HTTP, you have TCP. Um, 
So the, the high-level protocol, which describes how to get documents from the web, and underneath that, our uh, very useful and flexible protocol designed for sticking packets together and pushing them out over the web. Um, and HTTP is built on top of TCP, um, but it introduces a set of limitations. Whereas uh, in modern applications, we want to go a little bit further. We want to say, well, I, I want to get rid of the limitations of HTTP, and I want to use TCP more directly. And that's what web, WebSockets allows you to do. It's uh, basically a simple negotiation protocol so that an untrusted website, so my, web, my application connecting to your server, um, they've never met each other before, as long as your server says, yeah, I, I accept WebSockets, I say, give me a connection, a little bit of negotiation takes place to prevent um, Scurry's connections, so you have your thousand connections a second and so on and so forth, and then you get a socket opened to pump data through however you like. Um, so you get that freedom to do the kind of application, the kind of sort of data, data protocol stuff that you want to do, rather than saying, well, HTTP is what you get, deal with it. So, WebSockets are TCP. Um, in order to use WebSockets and, uh, and applications for public APIs, we need to build that HTTP layer back again. Because unless you're doing a dead, dead simple application, just a socket that pumps binary data one way or another probably isn't going to be enough for you. Um, I mean, maybe you're making an echo server. Have fun. Otherwise, you're going to want to do something else. So this is why we're starting to see this kind of second wave of protocols of new ways of getting data over TCP that aren't HTTP, but um, use the same mechanisms and have the same sort of freedom on the web. And that's what I'm, that's what today's entire thing is going to be about. It's one such of these, of these new wave protocols, which is known as the distributed data protocol, which is a simple web sockets protocol. Uh, it's, it's incredibly simple. It makes HTTP look complex, and HTTP is a very simple protocol. Um, but this distributed data protocol, um, which I encourage you to read uh, about if you find this interesting later on, um, is a web sockets protocol specifically designed for the needs of modern web applications. So instead of being built around the idea of getting a HTTP document and serving that whole document to the client, so download all the HTML and the CSS and render the whole thing in one go, um, it's designed around the needs of modern applications, which is I want to have my uh, HTML and CSS sitting there on the client, already downloaded, and I just want to get notified when data comes. Or alternatively, I'm running an iOS application and my views are UI kit, um, UI views, and subclasses of that. And I, I already have that UI there. I don't want to download that every time. I just want to be notified when data comes in. So DDP is fundamentally about that, just reducing the protocol to the data for the application. It's also about um, a very simplified way of doing uh, server-side methods or remote procedure calls. So it's a combination of push state, pub sub um, data. So you get this nicely dynamic data and being able to communicate back with the server using a really simple version of RPC. So DDP only exists because of this little web application framework. Um, and this actually turns out to be kind of awesome because uh, the framework exists because of DDP and DDP exists because of the framework, which means that we have a really nice implementation of the protocol that we can use as a reference whenever we want to do this sort of uh, networking in the past. We don't have to start from scratch. Um, and also, if we want to build, say, for example, we're doing what I'm doing today, an iOS application that gets reactive UIs based on DDP, um, I can use the um, web application to rapidly build a server um, framework. So Meteor, uh, it's, a, it's a JavaScript framework. Uh, it's a really nice JavaScript framework. I've used it regularly for my work ever since it came out. Um, it's built around this idea of you have, a, you have a server and a client, but we don't want to deal with this idea of make a connection to the server, pull stuff down. Um, the client stays the client and has all, its, has all its information, and it wants to, people want to use it like an app. They don't want to have to wait for pages to load and so on and so forth. So it's that sort of rich internet application style thing. And it uses this DDP to reactively update the screen when anything happens. So say, for example, um, I have an application where I want to know um, I have a series of chunks of audio coming in, and I want to be able to, I want to have a, like a timeline sitting there. This is something I've done recently. And as new audio comes in, I want to see it and, and be able to play it back. 
So if I was doing it via HTTP, I'd have an XML HTTP request connection, an AJAX connection open up. I'd be going, hey, is there something new? Is there something new? Is there something new? Constant little pings of data. When I get something, I download it, re-render the page, and so on. With Meteor, we have this sort of PubSub push API. The server says there's some new data. Here it is. Comes down to the web page. The web page um, then has a really nice little interface uh, in, inside the framework called Spark, which says, cool, that little bit of data is being depended on by this element in the page, this element in the page, this element in the page, this element in the page. I'll just re-render those little bits. So the whole page stays there, new stuff comes in, no re-rendering happens except where it needs to. So it's kind of really efficient in that respect. Uh, it's really simple, it's, it's kind of a big deal with that. And it's built entirely around this protocol, DPP. And as it turns out, we can do the same thing in iOS. So very quickly after the Meteor framework came out, people started going, hey, that's really cool. I'd like to be able to do that in my own uh, platform. So you started seeing Node.js built a DDP library, uh, and iOS developers built this little library called Objective DDP. Now it's really, really early days, but it does allow us to do everything that Meteor allows us to do when it comes to communicating with data. So if I use Objective DDP in my application rather than traditional uh, REST-based networking, so rather than networking, I use DDP, I can get continual push state notifications when something changes on the server, and I can push changes back to the server over the same sort of single, um, simple connection. So that's more or less the foundations of this. There's, there's not a lot to it. It's one of these things that's better seen than, uh, than he bashed about. So what I really do with this presentation is I'm going to hack together a quick implementation of a very, very simple app. Um, we'll build the Meteor server, which turns out to be about 100 lines of code, um, JavaScript code, give or take. Um, and we'll build a little iOS application that depends on the same data. And the goal that we have here is somebody can change something on a web page and it updates the iOS application. Somebody can change something on the iOS application, it updates the web page. If there was another application connected, that would also be updated because of this sort of pops up push state API. So I'm going to switch down to uh, the application. Unfortunately, I can't put the computer up here because it falls off. So okay, let's put the terminal up. Might actually be able to play nice. Yeah, very good. Okay, so. We have two sides of the application we're going to build here. Um, we have our Meteor web server, which is just going to be a very simple web application that serves our purposes. And then we're going to build a simple iOS application in, uh, in Xcode. So the app that I built beforehand that I'm going to redo um, is just a little grocery list app. So the idea is that um, I have a list of groceries. I share the account with my girlfriend. Uh, I'm walking down to the, uh, to the supermarket. She realizes we need tissues, so she hits the web page or hits it on her own phone, puts in tissues, and instead of having to resync or re-download the data, I immediately know if I've got the application open. So, dead simple. Um, probably wouldn't work in the real world because you want offline access as well, um, but there we go. So we'll start off by building the media application. It's pretty straightforward. Um, if you have, if you would like to get to Meteor, Meteor.com is where you go to. It's a very simple install process on OS X or Linux or I'm guessing OS X around here. Um, they have a shell script you can control paste and run. That'll install it into user space so you don't need uh, pseudo access to, to run and build Meteor apps. Just copy paste that into your shell. It'll install Meteor system wide for you. And once you are ready to get started, you go somewhere where you want to install something. So I'm going to go to my desktop. And there's a nice little command line utility that does the uh, bootstrapping for you, which there is very little. So basically, I'll go, OK, um, Meteor create groceries. So Meteor is the terminal command. Um, create is the uh, new application command. And then I'm creating an app called groceries. So if I look at my desktop, I've got a new directory called groceries. If I change into that, it's given me the basis of the application. So it's your typical bootstrap stuff for web frameworks. Um, it's given me a JavaScript file. 
um, and a HTML file, which is where the templating happens, and some CSS, which we're not going to touch today because I'm lazy. Um, so a simple media application can be literally one JavaScript file. You can actually go a lot bigger and build packages and, and do all sorts of fancy stuff. It's not necessary. So once you've got the application built up, you can quickly just, if you just type the media command in the directory, you get a web server running. Um, starts it on localhost 300, 3000. I can now access that from a browser. This is a sample application. Um, all it does in, the, in their bootstrap, I believe, is so it has a Hello World template that renders out, and when you click, I think it notifies the console. Let's have a look. The console is too small. Yeah, you press the button. Anyway, so we'll be replacing that. But what that, what that has given us is a HTTP server running on localhost 3000 that gives us that web interface, but it's also done the entire job of setting up that WebSockets protocol. So we have this WebSockets protocol open, and in fact, um, the web, web page itself is using that uh, WebSockets protocol to connect back to the server. If I go to the, uh, uh, where is our connections thing? I'm going to open this in Chrome because the uh, Safari developer tools have this frustrating thing where they collapse the icon names when you're not looking at it. So if you look at the network, a bunch of GET requests, and where are we Damn it, I don't think they have one open. Uh, the, the application is too simple to have a, it doesn't have a WebSocket connection open unless you have data coming in. So I'll show you that in a moment. So that's what we need to get our server set up. We're going to need to build some things into that, so that's what we'll do, do next. But on the other side, um, we also want to set up the iOS application to use Objective DDP, which is the library we're going to use to build that end. Um, and that also turns out to be pretty simple. So I'm just going to create um, a simple. I'll just start with an empty application template. Find it's easier. All these groceries. Just for iPhone, we don't need to use core data. So we're getting our data from the server. And we're going to call it, oops, let's call it um, groceries iOS. Now, uh, in order to go forward with this, we need the Objective DDP library installed, and that has another dependency on um, Socket Rocket, which is a really simple uh, WebSockets uh, implementation for iOS. Um, rather than having to manually install all that crap and maintain versions and so on and so forth, um, I'm going to use the CocoaPods project, which you may or may not have experienced, and if you have, you should. So if you look at CocoaPods.org. These guys are basically like uh, Homebrew or um, Node Package Manager for iOS projects. So it's a version and library installation manager. Um, just a simple thing is you can say, I want um, Objective DDP or AF Networking or Magical Record in my project. It'll set all that up for you, set up the workspace, make sure that they, at the latest version, you can easily update that stuff. So that's what we're going to do. Um, the way you do it is you have your Xcode project, you create it manually first. And you go to the terminal, you go to that directory, desktop, groceries, iOS, and you go, um, if you haven't installed uh, CocoaPods, there's an there's a install process for that before. But basically, you create a pod file, as you can see here. So I'm going to go vim pod file in the root directory of my iOS application. And in that pod file, you just create a simple plain text list of the stuff that you want. So I actually have that in another thing. So it's it's a pretty simple plain text based thing. You say what platform you're going to deploy to, in this case iOS 7, um, and you say here are the pods that I want. So in this case I want Objective DDP. Um, there are some optional configurations saying I want to get it from the master branch of GitHub, uh, and that's the case for Socket Rocket as well. Um, they have stuff that they host in the pods repository as well, so you can uh, you can uh, get stuff directly from there. As it turns out, Objective DDP is not in that wrapper yet. But um, again, CocoaPods is kind of generic. It's just a Git wrapper. So if something that you want to use in your Xcode project isn't available in the CocoaPods repository, you can still directly hook into the, the uh, Git repository like I'm doing here. So I've edited that file. It's sitting there in the, in the root directory of my Xcode project. Then I'll just go to that thing and go pod install. And it figures out 
the dependencies based on that pod file, downloads all of the projects, configures them to work with my um, with my current deployment target. So for example, I'm deploying to iOS 7, it'll make sure there's an iOS 7 compatible version, it'll uh, turn on Arc or on or off, on, off or on Arc for the files if it turns out they're Arc or non-Arc compatible. Um, and then generates a workspace for us to use. So instead of using the other one there. So instead of using the uh, groceries, groceries workspace pro uh, project I had before, I now open up the workspace, and as well as my standard project, I also have all of the libraries I wanted to install. Oops, I think I've destroyed my. What have I done here? <laughs> I think it's open another another window. Yes, it is. One thing you'll discover is you should never open up a workspace for the project and the project as well. Um, they don't play nicely in Xcode. Okay, so now I have a um, an Xcode project, a standard Xcode project, but I also have these extra Cocoa pods, so I can now import that stuff into my application um, like it was a framework, like it's a system framework. So I can say, for example import objective ddp meteor client as a framework so using angle brackets so um takes care of all of that um is it arc or non arc do i need to compile it for this target all of that stuff is taken care of by the xcode um sub project build system which is kind of nice so now we have a project that's set up to use to serve as a client for meteor um, and we have a meteor server let's start building an actual application so again what's the first thing we need to do when we're Building a database application is kind of define the type of data we're using. In this case, it's really kind of dead simple. I'm just going to open up that um, oops. Just going to open up in TextMate that uh, the web application. Which gives us these three files. So, if we look at this uh, at the application that's running in the browser, there it hasn't got a lot of code to it. A lot of it's just happening in the framework, which is nice because I don't want to have to think about that stuff. Um, what we need to do, what we want to do, is the first thing we want to do is define some data. And um, in this thing, we're just going to have a simple list of groceries. So I just want a collection of grocery items. Uh, in Meteor, you can define these as uh, as data collections by just doing this. It's just a JavaScript variable. So bar groceries equals new Meteor collection. Give it a name, groceries. That's going to be kind of important because of our subscription later on. But what that's doing is it's creating a persistent collection on the server. So internally, Meteor uses the MongoDB database. But it also sets up an API for subscribing to that data from one or many clients. So the next thing we're going to do to make that available to our iOS app is um, go to our server section and set up a publication. So this is a pub sub protocol for DDP. So again, we're just going to uh, go, okay, meteor.publish. Publish is, a, um, is the function that publishes that stuff, publishes a particular collection or some data over DDP. It's very simple and generic. You give it a name again. I'm going to call it the same thing as uh, as the collection name in this case. You can give it another name. Um, and the publish function takes a name for the publication and then a JavaScript function that returns, takes optionally takes some parameters. So you can say, I want certain things in this collection, otherwise in this subscription, otherwise won't give the right data back. Um, or basically just um, returns some formatted data. So in this case, I want it to return all the groceries that are available for the current user. So Meteor does have, a, have authentication built in. Um, I'm not going to bother with that at the moment. It's going to publish all groceries. We'll handle that later. So it, had, it exposes a simple Mongo API for doing that. So all I'm going to do in this groceries publication is return groceries, which is our groceries collection up there, dot find. So what I'm just saying there is, this is essentially a select star from table, um, which 
for a prototype to begin with is fine. So basically what's going to happen is any groceries in that collection will be published to the client and they can access them and use them as data. So um, on our web app, so we can start interacting with that, you need to do the other, and what we'll be doing in iOS in a moment is you then subscribe to that collection. So in Meteor, because it's a, both a server-side and a site, client-side framework, um, within the same file, you can do things conditionally based on whether you're on the server or the client. So you can actually have shared files between servers and clients. Um, you can also actually segregate these files separately, but in this case, we're just going to leave it in one file. So in the client, we then want to do the same thing. And we'll go meteor.subscribe, which is the other end of the PubSub protocol. Um, and again, we want to subscribe by this, so it's subscribed by name. So essentially, we're talking about PubSub channels here. And I don't need to do anything else there. If I needed to pass some parameters, I'd also pass them alongside there. At the moment, we're not even going to do that. So we now have set up a DDP publication in about four lines of code that publishes a list of groceries pulled from a database, of which there are none so far. And then on the HTTP client side, um, we now have subscribed to that and we can use it to interact with on the UI. As it turns out, it's pretty much the same process to do that on iOS. So uh, generally what will happen is you'd set up the subscriptions in the, uh, in the app delegate or in the root um, application. So we're going to set up a Meteor client there. Again, we're going to objective DDP Meteor client. So I'll check the one I did earlier. Make sure I mess it up. Oh, we also need objective ddp.h. Okay. So once again, we are going to basically just set up on iOS the same subscription. So we've, we've got that publication already done on the server. So uh, at the over at the over point on application launch, we just want to instantiate uh, some these these clients here. So first thing we're going to do is just quickly create a property for the uh, Meteor client. And you use this in a bunch of places, so I'll make that a strong reference. Meteor client, Meteor, and then in our app delegate, self dot Meteor client, Meteor equals Meteor client alloc net. Now Meteor is the it handles the the niceties of connecting to the Meteor server and back. We also need to assign to it the actual objective DDP protocol. So that comes in as well. So I can go self, I can go objective DDP, DDP equals, and this is where we make a connection, objective DDP alloc, nip with URL string, and we pass in a WebSocket connection URL to the server we want to connect to. And I believe we want to make the delegate this application. So what is that URL string? It's pretty straightforward. So my um, local web server is running on localhost 3000. The WebSocket is WS. It's a nice thing about WebSockets is it kind of works very similar to HTTP. Localhost 3000. So that will make a connection to the actual WebSockets end of the of the server. Um, I think it's running on the same port. I'll just check. Yes, it is. Um, and I think it has a root WebSocket URL. So again, WebSockets, the way WebSockets works is it, it first makes a HTTP connection, so it still gets a URL like a, a standard REST web page, then it upgrades that to a socket connection. So that's what's happening there. So then all we need to do is assign that protocol connection to the client. And that's pretty much it. So that opens our connection. So if I now build the versus iOS target just for the simulator. Assuming I haven't screwed something up. Let's try. Uh, I think I need to make it. yes. Nope. I think it's fine. So if I run this, not much is going to happen at the moment, but if we look at uh, 
Hell. Ah, curse you. I haven't finished my root view controller. Never mind. Just starting with a with an empty application. Might just create a storyboard so we can do that. my storyboard. There we go. It's the old thing where you, if you define a window in the app delegate, then you need to create your app programmatically, whereas if you're using storyboards, you don't. Okay, so we're do not doing anything, but we are opening a connection back to the WebSocket server, which is running over here. So let's do something useful with that. So we have a collection of groceries. Let's actually make it possible to create and delete groceries. So just some basic CRUD. So on the client, I'm actually going to grab this from my prepared earlier stuff because it's kind of mostly unnecessary. So on the client, um, we can define uh, HTML templating. So being a web framework, it provides a nice templating system based on handlebars.js, um, which allows you to do define things. So for example, it allows us to render out a grocery list on the client and take out the, front, the content of the groceries, put them on screen. It allows us to have buttons on for adding and removing them, um, which I'll take you through in a moment. Yes, do too much. Well, let's go with one I prepared earlier. This code demo is as typically not going as I. Okay, so with a whole heap of muttering about and making a mess of things, um, here is the result of um, just some very simple hacking together of the Meteor um, through the Meteor templating system, which again is kind of beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but if you're into web application development, I highly recommend you check it out. Basically, all that I've done is using that groceries collection we defined at the beginning, I've set up some simple templates to render out basically uh, you know, list of groceries that we'll be seeing on the client. Um, I've created a simple form that lets you say, I want to add something, say MacBook Air, and say 12 of those, 
add them to the grow through list, I can delete them. So you simple basic CRUD stuff. Um, on the web application server, we have defined some functions for doing that. So we have add item, so this is your basic CRUD stuff, update item, remove item. Um, I, Meteor actually includes um, auto-generated scaffolded CRUD, um, but I did it manually because I wanted to do some custom stuff and to introduce that to you. So these methods here, meteor.methods, um, add item, but I've ex explained update item and a remove item, are not only exposed within the framework to the web application client, so when I add item here, I'm adding it to there, they're also exposed over the DDP connection so they can access them from other clients. So I can call remove item, update item, and add item from my iOS application. And again, if I switch back to the one I prepared earlier, that's exactly what we're doing. So I'll just take you through. I think, don't think I'm going to have time to build the whole thing from scratch. Um, so I'll take you through the, the pre-built one. And hide that and hide that. So a very simple application um, called Groceries in Space with a table view that gets that, that data. Um, it's got authentication, which we won't worry about at the moment. And again, that same form for adding and removing groceries. So because again, if I pull that up, because of my app delegate, I made my localhost connection to the same server. So you can see the, uh, the stuff, the content I've got in there. Um, and if I look at my actual master view controller here, um, I also set up the equivalent of those subscriptions. So if you, where's my subscription? Where did I do my conduction? Using on this. Oh, yeah, here we are. So I did that in the authentication controller, which is a bad place to do it. So here is the equivalent of the client side subscription on iOS, which is just again self.media client, add subscription, you pass in the name of the subscription you want to subscribe to, and in this case, because in my example I'm using authentication, I'm also passing in a user ID to say I just want this user's, this user's stuff. So that sets up that connection to give me access to that data, um, which means that on my uh, actual content controller and the master view controller in the application, um, I've, got access, I've got this local collection, local array called self.groceries, which I'm actually pulling directly from that uh, DDP collection groceries which has been made accessible to me via the thing. So if I run this, and authenticate because of the horrible, if I turn off retina, can I do that? Let's find out. Nope. Oh well, sorry, giant screen. But if I authenticate, we have the same content. So, I mean, this, as far as we are right now, we're dealing with, that would be the same as REST, right? So it's coming immediately, but we're still essentially downloading some content. So let's just demonstrate the thing happening. So if I go into here, I'm just gonna drag this so we can see both screens at the same time. So if I create a new item here, um, what's something somebody would buy? Red Bull. <laughs> I'm so creative. Um, four cans. <laughs> well, yeah, it has been a long morning. I apologize, this demo did not go as smoothly as I'd hoped. Um, but as you can see, it came in immediately on, on the iOS UI. And if we go the other way around and go say, uh, coffee, <laughs> all, all coffee. Oh, that's right, don't work on me, you bastard. I don't think I actually, I think I've broken my iOS connection. Why? 
didn't actually add it to the local one. Uh. <laughs> I think it's because, oh, I know exactly why it was. Sorry, that was a feature that I didn't expose. Um, the server side is actually checking to make sure it's a valid quantity when you try to add an item. So that's why I was doing custom methods. I'm doing some validation. I'm saying, hey, does, that, um, does the quantity match a number with a, with a unit to make sure that people are putting in right things? So if I was doing this properly, I'd say, um, I'd give back an error saying, hey, you need to put in a real quantity and so on and so forth. But demonstrate that again. iOS. Salami. 800 grams. As you can see, it's sort of being pushed back and forth between the servers. Um, and you get a whole heap of, uh, a whole heap of flexibility on, on how you do that. So if I had, um, I could implement a sharing feature, for example, at the moment, it's just based on the, on the user ID on the account. So for example, if I were to share this grocery list with a friend, they'd have to use the same account as me. But these are just queries um, that are being pushed over this WebSockets protocol, which I hope, hope we can show actually being open now. Um, if I show you the, let's open that in Chrome again. Ha, huh, different user. Pull up the network. Come on. Here we are. So we have a WebSocket connection that's been opened uh, between the server and the client, and that's the actual one place where the data is going back and forth. All of these other um, connections are just because we're in development mode, and it's reserving all of the. Uh, all of their static assets, the CSS files and the JavaScript files for the framework separately. So all of this data is just being pushed up and down by that one WebSocket connection. Um, and similarly on iOS, we have a WebSocket that's opened. If it closes, it gets reopened, and that data gets pushed up and down between them. So you have this kind of nice ability to have live updating UIs for multiple clients. So I could, for example, have um, a quiz application and push out the answers and at the same time to all clients, they would get that data updated on their interface. So this is the kind of thing that um, WebSockets and GDP is really good for, um, my horrendous demo notwithstanding. Um, if you're in the scenario where you need to be able to um, reactively update interfaces, so just push information when it comes in immediately rather than waiting for a refresh or a pull, if you need a streaming API or if you need live updating content, that's exactly what um, GDP is really, really good for. Um, and with objective GDP, we can now do this in iOS. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, how many clients could you, could you have for this feature? As many as your server can handle. So uh, GDP is, uh, Meteor is built, the current implementation of the server is built on top of Node.js. Um, and it's actually a, a um, modified version called Fibers, which is designed for large scalability. So the idea is every time you get a new connection, providing you set it up that right and unblock the connection, um, you could ostensibly have as many processes open as your CPU or number of CPUs can support. So you could have, and again, because it's non-blocking, um, you could essentially have thousands of clients connected to the one server, or you could have two clients connected to the one server. Um, you could have multiple servers with multiple clients connecting between each other. So Meteor does support server-to-server -server, um, GDP as well. It's fairly new. Um, I haven't played with it yet. But the idea is it should be enormously scalable. Um, that being said, it's a very, very new protocol and you could break it quickly. Um, but there is no hard limit on the number of uh, users you can have connected to a, a subscription. And there's no technical limit to the number of subscriptions you could have. I could have thousands of different subscriptions for different like arbitrary things. So you know, you could have one for each aisle or I could you know, have a, a podcasting app where I have different subscriptions for every channel and be pushing live audio through that channel. Um, pretty much all of that's possible, um, but again, very, very early days in the protocol, but it is open source, um, which is why these things exist. So please check it out and fix it. <laughs> hey. Not at the moment. Yeah. So at the moment, the, the way that the library is set up, um, it's opening the socket connection on did become active and refreshing the stuff. 
So when you close it down, Socket Connection will probably close because of iOS's background task multitasking rules. Um, you could probably keep it open for like up to 10 minutes based on the, you know, you can ask for a connection to finish. Um, in iOS, you can say, I need to do some background processing. But again, that puts you at the mercy of the operating system. If it says something's more important, they will close down your application. Um, so it's not a huge deal in the sense that as soon as you open up the WebSocket again, it's going to give you the newest version of the truth. Um, but if you needed to have stuff happening in the background, you would need to find a solution for that. And the current implementation of the iOS library doesn't support it, but um, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing that happen. Um, I'm personally hoping to implement uh, that Mongo, Mini Mongo API for offline access. Um, that's something I'm very keen to do myself, so I'm planning on starting a GitHub repository very soon. Because at the moment, for example, if, you ha if your phone's offline, you don't get access to any data. And what I'd like to see is, like in the actual Meteor web application, if the, if the server and the client is disconnected, you can keep using the app, and when they reconnect, the data gets pushed back. So that, that's the, the other side of the reactive UI was everything happens and then it gets synced to the background. The iOS library at the moment is very early days, doesn't do that. It requires that connection to be open. Um, but it's definitely possible to do that. Um, I'm hoping to wrap core data around that API. Um, so yeah, at the moment, no, um, but I would imagine soon, yes. Cool. Uh, any other questions? I think we're just about at time. Um, yeah. Yeah, I did leave a lot open, so. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, ask, when you talk about, like, basically, No. So the data comes when you push stuff over it. So, for example, um, when you're so the as I um, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, Apple's push notification service is a push style API. So it's not DDP, but it is the same idea in that it maintains a long running connection that pushes data over it. Um, but maintaining the connection itself does not cost uh, a lot of money um, to maintain. Like so, your mobile charges are charged based on data sent, and the connection remaining open might use a kilobyte in a day. Um, well, it'll probably use a bit more than that because it uses a bit of data every time it closes and reopens. So if you go out of data and reconnect, you'll have like a kilobyte or two while it negotiates that connection. But when it's just sitting open, um, unlike long polling where it's constantly having to go, am I still there, am I still there, am I still there, which does have a massive data cost over time, um, long-running connections like WebSockets don't. So that's one of the reasons why they're pushing for that um, over the traditional XML HTTP stuff. So like, like push, you can have the connection open for as long as you like, barring the fact, of course, that the application doesn't work in the background um, and it won't cost you any data unless you're using it. Yeah. Uh, again, the WebSocket connection itself won't, um, but if you're sending a lot of data, it will. So it's the same of, it's the same as a thing. Um, I would imagine that the current implementation of the WebSockets protocol probably would. Um, have some battery impact because we don't have the same low level access as the Apple push notification stuff to keep itself at low power except when it needs to be higher power. Um, I can't guarantee that it wouldn't have a battery impact. I imagine it probably would, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, it's nowhere near as significant as um, REST is if you're getting a lot of REST data through because you're not constantly opening up that connection and closing it. So when you're opening a connection, you open the you're, you're basically telling the, the thing, give me as much bandwidth as possible. Um, and basically you're talking about waking up the Wi-Fi if, you haven't, if your Wi-Fi is going to low power mode or anything like that. Um, again, I don't have the expertise to know whether or how much it would affect it. I haven't noticed it affecting stuff myself, but then again, it is only working in the foreground for the moment, so I don't have it open all the time. Um, but as with anything else, it's... um. It's a thing where you have to trade off the speed at which you want to get at the data with with the battery life requirements. Cool. Okay. I will end my second recording. Maybe not. Okay. Bye. <laughs>
Okay, well, I'm going to pack up now so that the next guys can get in if you want to do it. Thank you very much for coming and seeing my disastrous demo. Um, and I hope, nevertheless, um, you saw something that was at least interesting to you. Because um, it is, I'm, I'm quite fond of the idea of uh, having more capabilities in our hands than just simple HTTP. Because I, mean, I still use that constantly. Um, and I will, because it's a very good protocol. Um, but different protocols for different applications. If you have an application that needs real time data, then Things like WebSockets and PDP are a really good option, um, and so will the competitors if once they happen. Cool. Thanks, guys.